The meteor strike that created the KPG mass extinction event would mark the end of end of the Mesozoic era and the beginning of the Cenozoic. Now, the Cenozoic era brings us from about 66 million years ago to today, and it consists of three periods, uh, the Paleogene, the Neogene, and the Quaternary. Now, we'll talk about the Paleogene and the Neogene periods in this video, and what we're going to talk about first is how life recovered from the KPG mass extinction event, but we're also going to learn that the that the world during this period is going to look a lot more familiar to you than it has before. We're going to see a world dominated by angiosperm plants, by arthropods, by mammals, and by birds. So stay tuned while we talk about the Cenozoic era. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. The Cenozoic era is the era in which we are now. The Cenozoic era began at the end of the Cretaceous period uh, with the KPG mass extinction event. Now, when we talk about the Cenozoic era, we're going to actually talk about it in this the entire era uh, in this video. Now, the first thing I do is remind you a little bit about how we mark geologic time. Remember, eras are divided into periods, and the Cenozoic era is divided into three distinct periods. The Paleogene, the Neogene, and the Quaternary. We are in the Quaternary right now, and in this video we'll talk about the Paleogene and the Neogene periods. However, each period is also subdivided into smaller units known as epochs. And because we're talking about such recent history, and because the details we have are, are, are much greater uh, because it's such a more recent geologic time period, we're actually going to talk about the epochs that make up each of these periods as well. It'll help us mark time in more specific uh, time periods. So just remember, it's era then those eras are divided into periods and periods themselves are divided into epochs. So uh, I'm trying, I'll try not to confuse you, but uh, try to kind of follow along as we go. So when we start the Paleogene period, which is the first of the three periods that make up the Cenozoic era, the first epoch is actually known as the Paleocene. So the Paleocene Epoch, which lasts from about 66 million years ago to about 55 million years ago, uh, falls on the heels of the KPG mass extinction. And what we're looking at is a world that is now devoid of the large bodied herbivores and carnivores that had dominated the planet Earth uh, during the Cretaceous. Now, these were almost exclusively reptiles. Uh, and evidence suggests that not only were all of them wiped out, pretty much any species that was bigger than about 25 kilometers in size was completely gone. So while those large-bodied reptiles are gone, we're going to start to see it's going to be the warm-blooded, the endothermic mammals and birds that are going to undergo some pretty heavy radiations to take over those ecological niches. Now, at the beginning of this particular epoch, we're going to see most of these species are going to be small. But because those large-bodied carnivores and herbivores are now gone, those ecological niches are now open. And by the time we get to the end of the Paleocene, we're actually going to start to see large-bodied mammals begin to fill into those niches. Birds would also undergo a heavy radiation during this period. We would see both flightless and flying birds during this period. Some of the flightless birds would actually grow to be massive in size, and many of them were actually carnivorous. So you can actually picture these, these uh, Paleocene forests um, being dominated by these large carnivorous, uh, you know, bipedal, um, flightless birds uh, that were probably quite horrifying at the time, hunting down these sort of smaller bird and mammalian cousins. Now, reptiles did survive as well as the amphibians, but again, they're going to remain fairly small in stature and occupy the minority of uh, be the minority species in most ecological niches, which are now being dominated by mammals and birds. Although there are some particular ecosystems in which reptiles did remain the apex predators uh, during this particular epoch. Now, during the Paleocene, we're actually going to see that there are four distinct groups of mammals that exist. Uh, we'll see that we, we saw the first true marsupials, the first true mo so marsupials, things like koalas, kangaroos, etc. The first true monotremes, so platypuses and echidnas. The first true placentals, which are pretty much all other mammals on the planet Earth. And a group known as the multi-tuberculates. They all appeared uh, towards the end of the Cretaceous, and they're all prominent in ecosystems throughout the majority of uh, the majority of this period as well. Uh, the multi-tuberculates are actually now extinct, uh, but the other three groups still live on uh, in the modern day world. 
Uh, reptiles, like I said, they were also still around and, and they had diversified. So we're uh, gonna we see, of course, crocodiles and alligators are still around. There's a group known as the Champasaurs, which kind of look a lot like crocodiles and alligators, but they're different. Uh, they actually have gone extinct, uh, and we'll also see uh, other modern groups of lizards and, and species that are roaming around. But again, they're not going to be the dominant species that they once were on the planet Earth. And all of the dinosauromorph archosaurs uh, have now uh, gone extinct at this point. The KPG mass extinction event decimated forests worldwide. Uh, many of the forests, forests were decimated and gymnosperms were incredibly hard hit. The angiosperms actually fared significantly better. This is likely due to the fact that many angiosperms were actually dependent on arthropods for their fertilization and their reproduction. The good news is, is the arthropods were largely unaffected by the KPG mass extinction event. Therefore, it makes sense that their angiosperms, uh, their, 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 their close relationship with angiosperms actually helped make the angiosperms fare better than their uh, wind dependent gymnosperms uh, did. Now, what we see in the forest, it appears that there was a bit of ecological succession that took place. It seems like uh, the recovery of the forest occurred in the following uh, the following way. Uh, first, ferns sort of took over, then it was the conifers, and then we would start to see angiosperms uh, begin to repopulate and start to dominate. From this point forward, plant life on the planet Earth would be, in, would be almost completely dominated by the flowering angiosperms. Now, by the time we get to... Uh, by the time we get to the Paleocene Epoch, we're going to see some modern plant species begin to appear. We're going to see, for example, the first cacti. We're going to see the first palms appear on the planet Earth. Uh, this would just be the beginning of the angiosperm dominance during this point in time. The end of the Paleocene is actually marked by something uh, known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Uh, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum is a very interesting case study for what's going on on Earth today. We see a rapid accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we see accordingly a fairly steep uh, and significant rise in the Earth's temperature that lasted for about 200,000 years. Earth's temperature went up by from somewhere between six and eight degrees Celsius uh, over this uh, fairly short window of time. By the way, I should state that this increase in temperature is nowhere near uh, at, occurred nowhere near the rate at which we're seeing now uh, as a result of human-caused. Um, climate change but nevertheless it kind of shows what happens uh, to a planet that undergoes rapid increases in temperature and what we see is a fairly rapid turnover in many uh, ecological niches as a result of some species not being able to adapt to this change in global temperature uh, for example we start to see uh, we start to see planktonic species uh, begin to turn over. So for example, this is gonna mark the rise of the dinoflagellates as the predominant planktonic species in the ocean. We're also gonna see uh, primates appear and diversify for the first time during this period as well. What we see as a result, uh, what we see during this particular point in time is again, a similar effect of what happens when carbon dioxide is introduced into the atmosphere. And this naturally causes a greenhouse, uh, a greenhouse change uh, in the rapid uh, warming of the earth. Kind of what we're seeing today in response to the human introduced carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So scientists are very interested. During the Eocene, uh, Eocene epoch, which lasts from about 55 million years ago to about 36 million years ago, uh, we see the planet change drastically. So uh, Laurasia has started to break apart, and we're actually going to start to see um, we're going to start to see North America, Greenland, and Europe sort of become detached from each other. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, we're going to see South America break away from Antarctica, and Antarctica start to cool. Although it wouldn't become sort of this frozen tundra just yet, as it's going to remain in partial contact with the continent of Australia. India, which had broken away from Africa several million years ago, just completes its long distance migration and is now slamming into the southern, uh, the southern southeastern portion of Asia, uh, beginning to create the Himalayan mountains. Madagascar is now sort of an island off the coast of Africa. Now, due to the events of the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, the Eocene, uh, the Eocene Epoch begins out with a very warm Earth. The Earth is so warm, in fact, that we actually see evidence of tropical rainforests as far north as Alaska and Greenland. And this is uh, actually shown in the evidence of fossil palm trees and stuff that we, we actually see. We have fossils of palm leaves and such, actually, that you can get from uh, these rock strata in Alaska and Greenland and other places where you just wouldn't see this. 
Uh, towards the end of the period, though, what's going to happen is the Earth is going to cool a little bit towards the end of the Eocene epoch. And as a result, we're going to start to see these tropical rainforests begin to retreat toward, back towards the poles where we typically, or back towards the equator where we typically find them. And instead, uh, they're going to be replaced by more temperate forests, uh, which greatly favors the angiosperms. Uh, and we start to see, again, the spread of the prominence of the angiosperms into these temperate forests. We're also going to start to see grass begin to appear uh, in swampier or, 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 or moister environments. We still don't have grasslands yet, although the first grasses did appear towards the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the Paleogene period. Um, so grasses are now becoming a more prominent member of, the, of, of ecosystems, although we still have yet to see the large-scale grasslands that we see in modern times. During this time period, we start to see the appearance of many modern uh, um, of mammal groups. So, for example, we start to see the first appearance of the even-toed ungulates, cloven-hoofed animals, pigs, goats, etc. We also see the first appearance of odd-toed ungulates, so horses, rhinoceroses, uh, and, and species uh, of that like. Uh, we start to see the uh, we start to see the the first group. Uh, we start to see the first hippos. Um, we start to see the first modern whales begin to appear. Uh, we start to see the first bats, uh, and, and, and uh, we see a diverse group of primates begin to appear. So we're starting to see uh, a group of mammals that look more and more similar to what we're seeing on the planet Earth at this point. The end of the Eocene is actually marked by an extinction event. It's not considered to be a mass extinction, but it's known as the Grand Kapoor. Uh, so the Grand Kapoor actually um, sees... Uh, just particular groups are, are sort of harder hit than others. Um, we see, rather than being completely decimated, we just see them start to, to get less diversity. So, uh, for example, um, in terms of whales, uh, there are two major groups of whales. They're the earliest, the, the most primitive whales, and then there are modern whales. Modern whales survive the Grand Kapoor, but the uh, the first whale species actually go extinct, uh, and, and they're gone. We see uh, primates, which had a diversity of over 100 different known species, uh, during this period dropped to uh, about 50 different species uh, during the Grand Kapoor. Um, and uh, they would recover over the next you know, 30, 34 million years or so, uh, but we do see some turnover in many of these groups as a result of this extinction event. The next epoch we'll talk about is actually known as the Oligocene, and the Oligocene is going to be the last epoch of the Paleogene period. The Oligocene is actually a period of mountain building. So we have India continuing to slam into, into Asia, and the Himalayans are still growing. We see Africa actually bump into uh, Europe and Asia Minor. This is going to have two effects. First, it's going to result in the appearance of the Alps, but it's also going to result in the formation of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, which hadn't existed uh, up until this point. We're going to see the Rockies begin to form for the first time. So you think of some of the tallest mountain ranges on Earth, these are all going to start forming during the late Miocene and the early Oligocene. It's during the Oligocene that we actually see the first grasslands and the first savannas begin to appear. And this is actually going to favor the appearance of grazing animals. So we're going to start to see, uh, we're going to start to see the ungulates uh, in these species uh, like antelope and deer and and buffalo and all of these species that are sort of these grazing animals are going to start appearing because we're going to start to see the first appearance of grasslands and savannas, which are home to the majority of these grazing animals. Now, what's interesting is grass is going to have a pretty pronounced effect on species. And the reason why is we're going to start to see, um, we're going to start to see this lifestyle begin to shape the species that live in these biomes. The big thing is we're going to start to see the uh, see increased running abilities. We're going to start to see fast moving species begin to appear. And the reason why is we're also going to start to see the appearance of fast moving predators. We're going to see the first canids appear in North America and we're going to start to see the first cats appear in Asia uh, during the Oligocene as well. So again, we're starting to see the appearance of more and more modern species as we get closer and closer to modern time. We're starting to see uh, a modern day uh, predator prey networks begin to be established. Modern day biomes begin to establish themselves as the Earth's cooling and looking more and more like an Earth that we know today. We also start to see the first appearance of modern looking whales, both toothed and baleen. We're going to start to see the first pinnipeds appear as well. So pinnipeds are species like walruses um, and, and seals and, and the like. Uh, they're going to start to appear during this time period as well. So again, more and more modern looking species are appearing at this point. 23 million years ago, the Paleogene period would end and give, uh, give birth to the Neogene period. So the Neogene period lasts from about 23 million years ago to about 2.33 million years ago. 
Uh, the Neogene period, again, is going to see the Earth looking more and more similar to what we look like today as we get closer and closer to modern times. During the Neogene period, in particular during the Miocene epoch, the first epoch of the Neogene period, we start to see a planet Earth that resembles pretty much what we see today. The only major exception at this point is going to be there's no land bridge uh, between North America and South America, not until the very end of this particular period. We'll talk about that just in a minute. We are going to see savanna and grassland biomes become a very prominent region, a very prominent biome in the world. We're going to see the we're going to see species that exist in these environments take on one of two forms. We're going to see, uh, particularly look at the grazers. They're either going to develop large body sizes. So we're going to start seeing species uh, like elephants, for example, and giraffes. They're adept in rhinos. They develop large body sizes in form of defense. Or we'll see the opposite. We'll see fast, agile herbivores like antelope, gazelle, and deer. And the reason why is they're now going to be predators existing in these grasslands. We're going to see fast, agile predators like dogs and big cats and bears start to appear uh, in the fossil record during this particular epoch. So we start to see this sort of adaptation to predator-prey relationships that we still see today. Um, so we're starting to see uh, grassland and savanna biomes that look very, very similar to what we see today. Primates begin to recover from the Grand Coupour, and um, we start to see their diversity range up orders of 100 species during this point as well. But one of the biggest things that's going to happen during this period is uh, some geologic activity is going to uh, going to play a role in what happens in particular with our ancestors. So one of the things that's actually going to happen is during this particular period, during the Neogene, there were frequent ice ages. And these ice ages uh, lead, are the result of a cooling Earth and the buildup of polar ice caps. Now, when we have ice caps, remember, we end up with low ocean levels. And one of the things that's going to happen somewhere between 10 million years ago and 5 million years ago is we're actually going to see uh, an underwater submerged archipelago that, exists between, that existed between North and South America actually begin to be above sea level. And this new archipelago actually ends up forming uh, a land bridge now known as Central America that connects the two continents. This is actually going to have a profound effect on the planet Earth. We're also going to see Antarctica separate from uh, Australia for the first time, leading to a circumpolar current. Both of these are going to have a chilling effect on the majority of Earth. Uh, the reason why the land bridge of Central America is now interesting is it's going to block direct flow of warm water from the mid-Pacific into the mid-Atlantic. And it's going to redirect that Gulf current that used to wash over towards Africa, and it's going to direct it up the eastern coast of North America. The end result was a cooling effect on the northern part of Africa. The other thing that's happening in East Africa in particular is that there's going to be subtle uplifting as a result of geologic activity, the collision of Africa with Asia Minor. The end result is East Africa is actually going to go from a tropical rainforest biome to that of a savanna. Now, this is particularly important because these combined effects are going to influence a group of, of primates that exist in this region. Now, of the 100 or so species of primates that existed, uh, about 7 to 10 million years ago uh, in Africa. We're not sure which one this happened to. But one of these groups is actually going to diversify. It's going to diverge. Um, and one of these groups is going to give rise to all modern day chimps and bonobos. The other group that ri arises from this group is going to give rise to all modern humans and our extinct ancestors. This is a conversation that's going to be the story of us. And we're going to talk about that in my next series of videos, what it actually means to be human. But our humanness is tied to the fact that at least one of these groups actually decided to stand up and start walking bipedally to protect them from the predators that lurked underneath the tall grasses, to allow them to adapt to a life without trees, to protect them from the harsh sun of the savanna biome. When we start talking about our ancestors, what we're going to learn is that the hominids are less of a straight path from the last common ancestors with chimpanzees to modern humans and more of sort of a crooked path. Our family tree is less a family tree and more, a, uh, more of a family bush dotted with several odd cousins and evolutionary dead ends. But the end result is the appearance of modern humans somewhere between 200 and 400,000 years ago. The next story I'm going to tell you is the story of us. It's the story of what it means to be human, of where we come from and, and where we're going. And I'm going to leave it at that for this video. That brings us to about 
three three million years ago or so at the end of the neogene in the beginning of the quaternary period that's what we'll start talking about in my next video so stay tuned during the Cenozoic era, life would recover from the KPG mass extinction event. It would also begin to look a lot more familiar to us, which shouldn't be a shock as we're getting closer and closer to human beings actually existing. Now, the experience of being human, what it means to be human, and our origins as a species will be the topic of my next video. I hope you learned a lot. I hope to see you at my next one. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.